dialogue and fa absolutely fantastic to be back in India. You're absolutely right. I have been here uh, several times on several official trips and also to a number of, of family weddings where you know, I've learned over the years to do my special, you know, light bulb, light bulb, motorbike, motorbike dance and dress up in all the, the proper gear. Unlike anybody else, like most of the other people tend to be wearing suits, I find, when I uh, go into the, into, into the receptions. And we, w when we arrive in, in Delhi or in Mumbai uh, to meet the rest of Marina's family, we always remember to bring a particular thing, either from the plane or from duty-free. Can you guess what it is? What? Black label is right. Uh, we, we tend to bring a bottle of whiskey. I, don't know whether I, I think the, the High Commissioner was a bit worried about whether I should bring this up uh, in, in, this, in this August come. We tend to bring a bottle of whiskey to add to the astonishing 1.5 billion uh, liters of whiskey that are consumed every year in this, in this country. Now, why, why do we bring this bottle of scotch to our relatives uh, in, in, in Mumbai and, and Delhi? Uh, actually, I, got, I, got, I just got some on the plane called, called Green Label, which I'd never heard of before. I, I certainly hope it isn't creme de menthe. Anyway, the, the reason, the reason we, we bring it, of course, is that there is a tariff in India. I'm embarrassed to relate, of 150% on whiskey. And I think this matters, and I'm going to explain why. I have no particular desire to attack Indian whiskey tariffs today. But I think the time has come to stick up for free trade and for, to make the case again for the immense benefits of a globalized economy, uh, where we learn from each other and trade freely with each other. And that case needs setting out here now, today. And I think perhaps I am qualified to do that because I belong to a select group of people who are not necessarily always approved of by what you might call the global liberal elites. And in the pages of good left-wing newspapers in my own capital, in, in London, I am denounced as, as what? A populist. I'm denounced because I was involved, I can't uh, hide it from you, I was involved in a movement opposed to what I see as the undemocratic nature of the European Union, and we were successful. And so I find myself bracketed, and I'm perfectly happy about it, I'm bracketed with various other figures around the world who are said to be populists, are people who come to power on a sort of tide of pitchfork-wielding rebellion against the conceit of the ruling classes. And so it's not so much that I want to stick up for the populists. I think they can, they can, they can take care of themselves. Populists have, tend to have pretty thick skins. I want to stick up for the people who vote for them because they aren't bad people. And they may feel worried about the security of the world or about terrorism. And they may feel that they aren't allowed to hold widespread opinions and that they are being sneered at or disapproved of. And they look at this great glittering globalized economy and they see some people getting very rich indeed. And they wonder why their own families aren't keeping pace and they fear that they may be the first generation to be, not to be overtaken in prosperity by their own children. And I don't think that these people should be dismissed or patronized, and they should be listened to. But nor should we draw the wrong conclusions about this wave of populism, which I believe we've been discussing at this conference. The answer is not to put up barriers or to weaken our trading systems. The answer is to use our international systems to give those people the jobs and the self-respect that they need and to show how trade can work for both sides and how fair exchange benefits everyone and is not zero sum. And the answer is for great nations such as India and Britain 
to tackle the concerns of our electorates together. And that means not going back to the 1930s with strong men in power everywhere, with autarkic and beggar thy neighbor policies of tariffs and other barriers to trade. You may remember Lord <coughs> Copper of the Beast. Does anyone remember Lord Copper of the Beast, the, the newspaper magnate in Evelyn Waugh's satirical novel Scoop, which was published in, I think, 1936? Uh, Lord Copper personally briefs a young reporter about his world view and the coverage he wants to see. The policy of the beast is for strong, mutually antagonistic governments everywhere, he says. Well, that isn't my policy, and I don't think it should be our policy. Uh, we believe still in multilateral cooperation, and we believe in the UK, in NATO, as the cornerstone of our defense. And we are one of the few countries in the alliance to meet the target of spending 2% of our GDP on our armed forces. We have shown our commitment to our collective security in sending a battalion to Estonia as part of NATO's enhanced forward presence. We support the UN in holding to account the regimes of such men as Bashar al-Assad. And by the way, we were the first P5 country to call for India to join the Security Council as a permanent member, as well as the Nuclear Suppliers Group. Like India, we in the UK know the threats of terrorism. And I can tell you that some of my wife's family were there in Mumbai in 2008 when those appalling attacks took place. And we're working already with India to tackle those threats with ever greater intelligence sharing. And we have, as you, you may know, some of the, in the UK, some of the most formidable intelligence capabilities in the world. We have no inhibitions in sharing our most advanced technology with India. Take the, the Hawk jet trainer. I saw a poster of one as I was coming in uh, from the airport. I think it was the Indian aerobatic team seemed to be flying them. A world-beating aircraft designed and made uh, in Bangalore by Hindustan Aeronautics in alliance with BAE Systems. And I, I, I know that uh, my distinguished counterpart, who, uh, who said he'd be sitting in the front row, but he seems to have vanished, Mr. Mr. Jai Shankar, there, there, there he is, the Mr. Jai Shankar. I think he told you this morning, uh, or so I read, that he thought Europe was in danger of shrinking and retreating in the world. I think that was the gist of what Mr. Jai Shankar said. I did, it, he doesn't seem to be contesting it. Well, I'm here to tell you uh, today, in the nick of time, that that is not the UK's approach, not the UK's ambition. We have reach in the UK. We've just decided to restore our military presence east of Suez with a three billion pound commitment over 10 years a new naval support facility in Bahrain. We have commitment to the wider world. The Royal Air Force has just sent typhoon fighters to Japan and South Korea on exercise Eastern Venture, showing Britain remains one of the handful of countries able to deploy air power 7,000 miles from home. And we have ambition. Our strategic defense and security review makes clear that the Royal Navy's new aircraft carriers will be present in Asian waters. The Five Powers Defense Agreement, uh, arrangement, uh, which joins Britain with Malaysia, Singapore, Australia, and New Zealand, remains the only permanent and multilateral defense pact in Asia. Twice a year, British forces exercise alongside our allies in Southeast Asia. And as our naval strength increases in the next 10 years, two colossal new aircraft carriers, as I say, uh, we will be able to make a bigger contribution. In the Indian Ocean, we have a joint UK-US facility on Diego Garcia, an asset that is vital for our operations in the region. We're also a member of the UN command on the Korean Peninsula, while in Brunei, we have de a deployable garrison 
of British Gurkhas. And like India, we have our principles, we have our, a similar approach to the world. When it comes to the tensions in the South China Sea, we are in favor of the rules-based order. Now, Britain takes no position on the merits of the competing claims, but we do take a view on how they are pursued. We oppose the militarization of the South China Sea, and we urge all parties to respect freedom of navigation and settle their disputes peacefully in accordance with international law. We regard last year's ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague as binding on both China and the Philippines. Indeed, may I respectfully say to our Indian friends that we regard all such judgments by panels as binding. We believe India can be a great force for stability in this region. The, the keystone of a great natural arc created by the Indian Ocean and running from Perth in the east to Cape Town in the west. This is the vast hinterland in which India rightly seeks to influence events. And quite frankly, we support what uh, Prime Minister Modi was saying yesterday in his ambition for India to rejoin the neighboring geographies. Imagine how wonderful it would be if the nations of South Asia, Afghanistan, India, Pakistan, could break down the barriers of mistrust and make the most of the economic opportunities and potential. And that is why security matters. That's why it's so fundamental, because without trust between countries, without the freedom of the sea lanes, 25% of world trade going through the Straits of Malacca, without a rules-based international order, we will find ourselves reverting to the uncertainties of the 1930s, when trade declined. And we all know the consequences. We all know what happened. And trade, I'm afraid to say, trade as a share of global GDP is declining now, for the first time since the 1990s. And that is partly why I'm so excited by the opportunities that the UK has today. Because as our Prime, Prime Minister, Theresa May, said yesterday, we believe that we can strike a new and healthy relationship with the European Union, supportive of the European Union. As I've said many times before, we want to be outside the main body of the cathedral, but supportive like a, a flying buttress. This was unfortunately mistranslated in a recent conference I was at. By the, uh, the, no, it was, somebody said, it was, the, the interpreter said it, we wanted to be a flying bucket. And uh, it, the, the, the French were particular. They were, uh, you know, qu'est-ce qu'ils veulent les Anglais? We said, quite a frying bucket. Uh, but we, we eventually explained to them that we wanted to be outside, but supportive. And that's what we can do. We want an arrangement based on free trade, but intergovernmental cooperation on all the things that matter uh, to all of us. And for the first time in 44 years, we in the UK are going to be able to campaign across the world for free trade, not just because it is in Britain's interest, though it undoubtedly is, but because free trade has lifted billions of people out of poverty over the last 50 years and has been the single greatest engine of human progress. And that is because free trade and economic interpenetration are of massive mutual benefit. Of course, it's a, you look at India and, and Britain, it's a, it's a cliche, but it is true. We managed to achieve together what we might never manage to pull off individually. And I need hardly tell this audience that the single biggest employer in Britain is an Indian company which makes beautiful Jaguars in the West Midlands and then sells them back to India. You may have heard that the curry restaurants in Britain managed to employ more people than the shipbuilding coal 
mining and steel industries combined, which is not a totally flattering statistic, uh, and may explain why some of us struggle with our waistlines in the UK, but I don't want you to think, I don't want you to think that we are all sitting in Britain munching poppadoms, because we are also out here too in huge numbers. There are four JCB factories here in India. We have British scientists teaming up with Indians to tackle the latest uh, superbugs. One in 20 private sector jobs here in India is in a UK company. And our trade is growing, 3% a year. But I don't think it's good enough, and I hope you don't think either. Because when you consider this is a country where there are 800, me 800 million people under the age of 35. You can see the scale of the opportunity. Uh, the population of Ireland is less than 5 million, and Britain somehow does more trade with Ireland than it does with the whole of India. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has set out a very exciting program, uh, 830 billion pound infrastructure investment plan. I want us, I want our UK engineers and surveyors and planners and consultants and architects and lawyers and bankers, I hope there's some bankers here today, step up to the plate. Take part in this incredible development and break down any barriers there may be to the participation of those British service industries in that great enterprise. And that is why I think the time is fast upon us when we need to turbocharge this relationship with a new free, free trade deal, such as we will shortly be able to do. We can't negotiate it now, but we can sketch it out in pencil on the back of an envelope. And just to give you an idea of the, the, the type of thing that we could do, let us go back to the whiskey with which I began and with which some of you may be in need. It is an extraordinary fact that even though, I don't think anybody here is going to deny this, even though Scotland is incontestably the home, the origin, the progenitor of Scotch whiskey, isn't it? the only place in the world where water trickles through the peaty glen in exactly the right way to turn it into liquid fire. And even though whiskey is itself, as far as I know, according to Wikipedia, a derived from a Gaelic word, whiskey, U-I-S-C-E, or possibly U-I-S-C-E-A-U-G-H, depending on how good your Gaelic is. Does anybody know what whiskey arc means, by the way? Anybody know? It means water, apparently, so they obviously drank a lot, a lot of it. Even though whiskey is incontestably Scottish, the total share of Scotch whiskey, the authentic whiskey, in the Indian market, the biggest single market in the world for the consumption of premium whiskey, the total share is something like 4%, netting the UK only 80 million pounds in exports. Now imagine if we could just double that or treble that by removing those pesky tariffs of which I spoke earlier on. Giving the Indian consumer more money to spend on other things, a good thing, double it to 8%. Think of the boost to morale of the Indian whiskey drinker, the boost to productivity uh, to, the Scottish, uh, to the Scottish industry, and then think how wonderful it would be if symmetrically uh, we could have zero tariffs on, on fantastic Indian products such as those electric cars or buses or perhaps even bicycles uh, that we're now seeing on the streets of London. This is not the time to put up barriers between our countries. This is the time to tear those barriers down. And I say to you, we may be leaving the EU, we may be taking back control of our borders, but my Indian friends, I say to you, that does not mean we want to haul up the drawbridge. We do not want to deter Indian talent from our country. And I'm proud to say that the UK economy is the single, not just the most dynamic, the fastest growing in Europe, but the most diverse, the most diverse 
on earth. We have the biggest tech sector anywhere in our hemisphere. FinTech, EdTech, MedTech, GreenTech, Biotech, NedTech, Nanotech, we've got it. Tech, we've got it. We have the biggest banking sector, indeed 40% of all foreign exchange transactions take place in London. More dollars are bought and sold in London than they are in New York. We have the most visited museums in the world. I think the British Museum alone receives more tourists than some European countries I could name, but I won't because of my famed diplomatic finesse. Uh, we, have, we, have the, we have the best universities in the world. I hope it's not too chauvinistic to point out that we have the best university in the world. Cambridge alone, Cambridge alone, has produced more Nobel Prize winners than every university in China and Russia added together and multiplied by two. I hope I haven't offended any of the countries I've mentioned. Of the kings, queens, presidents, and prime ministers of the world, an astonishing one in seven was educated in Britain. And that is a, a ratio we mean to keep, and we are going to keep, because I can tell you we have more Chinese students studying in London alone than there are in any other city in the world, outside China, obviously, where they have a lot of, a lot of, Chinese, a lot of Chinese students. And our numbers of Indian students, by the way, because I know this is a hot topic, our numbers of Indian students are increasing again, increasing again. I'm looking at the High Commissioner who's looking back approvingly uh, as, I, as, I, as I make this point. And that is because we welcome talent. We welcome talent in our city and in our country. And it's by being open and by breaking down barriers that we will, in the long term, create the jobs, the good jobs with good incomes that offer real hope and real comfort to our electors. And that should be our recipe. That should be our response to the, the tide of populism that is supposedly sweeping the world. So, my friends, let us work together. Not ignore those voices, not condemn them, but understand and address their concerns. Britain and India are united by our values and in many ways by our approaches to the problems of the world. And it is by working together to improve our security that we will allow the freedom and the openness that will drive our long-term prosperity. Malia and Sasha, under the strangest of circumstances, you have become two amazing young women. You are smart and you are beautiful, but more importantly, you are kind and you are thoughtful and you are full of passion. And